All right, so we're a couple of minutes past 10. So I suggest we, we get started. So good morning to everyone. And thank you for attending our webinar today, marking 1000 days of the Agoniland cleanup where SDN and CERD will be launching our um, public dashboard um, and, and our initiative on the, the independent civil society monitoring of the Agoniland cleanup project. My name is Calvin Ling. I'm the Acting Executive Director at SDN. I'll just quickly take you firstly through our agenda for today. So I'll provide a quick introduction and background to the Agoni land cleanup before I hand over to the Ambassador of the Kingdom of the Netherlands to Nigeria, Harry Van Dyke, to give an introductory message. And we have a goodwill message and reflections from the Honourable Minister of State for Environment, Sharon Akiazo. Unfortunately, because of the National Assembly 2022 budget presentation, she can't be here in person, but we've got a, a video message to play. Um, and then we'll get on to talking about the, the project that we're doing ourselves and the findings from it. So I'll talk briefly alongside my colleagues, Jesse Martin Manafort from SDN and Dr. Sam Kambari from CERD. And we'll give you an overview of the project we've been doing, the, the public dashboard, that we have where you can access data on a cleanup and the findings from our first biannual report and reflections on the first thousand days of the cleanup. We'll then hear from Mahra Bani, Executive Director at Lokiaka Community Development Center. And um, she is one of the, the monitors that's been doing this work with us. Um, and she's also from Agoni land. She's gonna talk a little bit about the, the real life impact of oil spill pollution in Agoni land and why the cleanup that's going on is so urgently needed. We'll then have time for question and answers to SDN and CERD. And before some closing remarks from, from HICREP themselves, Prof. Philip Shakolo, who's head of operations and also the officer overseeing the project coordination office. So please put your questions in the Q&A box and we will aim to respond to as many as possible. Um, if we have lots at the end, we're, we're quite happy to unofficially extend the webinar for a few minutes to try and answer as many questions and answers as, I can, as we can. And if you want to stick around for that, and please do be aware that this webinar is being recorded. So by way of very quick background to the cleanup, um, Ogoni land comprises four local government areas in River State. You can see a map indicating this on the top right hand sort of corner of this, this slide. Um, the, the background to the cleanup is that following decades of oil exploration and production in Ogoni land by the Shell Petroleum Development Company joint venture, and there were extensive protests in the 1990s in Agoni land over a number of issues, including extensive oil spill pollution in the region. Ultimately, production was stopped in the region in 1993. But this left a legacy of oil pollution, which had not been adequately cleaned up. So in 2006, the federal government of Nigeria invited UNEP to conduct an environmental assessment in Agoni land. So this slide shows us a bit of a succinct timeline of, of recent events. In 2011, we saw the report published by the United Nations Environment Programme on Agoni land. It documented extensive pollution across the region, called for urgent cleanup, as well as a series of emergency measures, such as the provision of clean drinking water. And it estimated that initial cleanup activities would take five years, that it might cost around a billion dollars to do the cleanup, and it would probably take more like 30 years to see full recovery in the region. It then took until 2016 for the hydrocarbon pollution remediation project, HYPREP, to be launched by the federal government of Nigeria. This is a project under the Ministry of Environment charged with implementing the cleanup and it was the 11th of January 2019 when the first contracts were issued to contractors to conduct the cleanup. And that is 1000 days ago today. This cleanup is, is really important. There are around a million people living in Agoni land, a significant proportion of them impacted by oil spill pollution, perhaps having health issues or having lost livelihoods because of this. And so seeing a proper cleanup in the region is, is critical for those people, but it's also 
more significant regionally as well. And there are many other areas in the Niger Delta which still have extensive oil spill pollution, which has not been adequately addressed. So seeing a successful cleanup in a Goni land could be a template for cleanup elsewhere in the Niger Delta. Um, so without further ado, though, I'd like to hand over to Ambassador Harry Van Dyke to provide some introductory remarks. Over to you, Ambassador. Thank you very much, Calvin. Um, Your Excellency Sharon E. Kaezor, Honorable Minister of State for Environment, representatives of HYPREP, NOSTRA, civil society organizations, members of the press and media, colleagues of the diplomatic corps in Nigeria, all protocols observed. I would like to thank SDN, the Stakeholder Democracy Network, for this opportunity to give a goodwill message at the launch of the digital platform that will provide on oil pollution cleanup in Ogoni land. The success of the cleanup is crucial for the livelihoods and the health of the people in Ogoni land. HYPREP, the Hydrocarbon Pollution Remediation Project, is an ambitious and important contribution to the cleanup. It's of great importance that HYPREP succeeds in its mission. The Honorable Minister Abubakar, former Minister for Environment, has put in a great deal of his time and effort to streamline the HYPREP organization. This underlines the importance the government attaches to HYPREP. Today, SDN and CERT launch a contribution from civil society to the shared objective of a clean and prosperous Ogone land. The platform that SDN and its partners launched today will provide all stakeholders involved with quality information on the programs, progress, and lessons learned in the cleanup. The availability of reliable and up-to-date information as facilitated by this platform is a valuable contribution to the cleanup. The purpose of SDN's monitoring project that started in, 2020, in 2019 is to cooperate with all communities and authorities involved. The data this project produces will contribute to continuous improvement of the cleanup and nourish the decisions of all stakeholders. The embassy has worked with SDN for many years. We appreciate SDN as a professional organization with a long-standing experience, knowledge, and a, and a network in the area. CERT, the Center for Environment, Human Rights and Development, has also been a long-standing partner for us, whose contributions in the region we greatly appreciate. The monitoring system presented today will provide data on the progress since the start of the cleanup, now thousand days ago. I encourage everyone involved in the cleanup to use and support this platform. And with these words, I wish the cleanup, HYPREP, and this new platform all the success and Godspeed. Thank you. Thank you very much for your message, Ambassador. That's really appreciated. And I must apologize because I skipped one slide before I started. So I'll just go back one. Um, before going further, I just want to sort of issue some, some thanks formally from myself and on behalf of SDN and um, to all of today's speakers for their participation today and to our network of civil society monitors and who are participating in this exercise and all the Agoniland residents who have given up their time to, to work with us on this. Um, also, my thanks to HYPREP and, and to NOSTRA, the National Oil Spills Detection Response Agency, and their minister, the Ministry of Environment for their engagement with this project, and also to UNEP, the United Nations Environment Programme, for their input, support and advice as we've started up this initiative. It's been highly appreciated. So now I will go on to, to provide the, to set up the goodwill message um, and reflections from the Honourable Minister of State for Environment. Sharon Ikiazo. Um, and if you'll just excuse me, I'm just going to double check that I have set up the settings so that you're going to hear this correctly. Yeah, off we go. This distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I'm My apologies for the technical hitch. This distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to be here today on the occasion of the launch of an online dashboard on the activities of the Hydrocarbon Pollution Remediation Project by Stakeholder Democracy Network. 
Following a review of previous efforts in the implementation of the UNEP report, the federal government reconstituted the HIPREP and situated it in the Ministry of Environment. The government also issued the statutory instrument on the establishment of HIPREP. And this was officially gazetted on December 12, 2016. The main objectives of uh, establishing HIPREP include the need to determine the scope modalities and means of remediation of soil and groundwater contamination in impacted communities. To also investigate, map and evaluate hydrocarbon polluted communities and sites in Nigeria. To undertake a comprehensive assessment and mapping of all environmental issues associated with hydrocarbon pollution. To also provide guidance data to undertake remediation of contaminated soil and groundwater in Ogoni land and such other impacted communities as may be referred to it and ensure full environmental recovery and restoration of Ogoni ecosystems and its services for the Ogoni people. While also ensuring compliance with existing applicable laws and governance or control frameworks under the environmental regulatory supervision of the National Oil Spill Detection and Response Agency. Since the year 2020, SDN and other civil service organizations have been carrying out independent monitoring of the hyper-driven Ogoni Line Cleanup project in collaboration with NOSRA to ensure transparency and accountability in the project implementation process through the collection and laboratory analysis of samples collected from the project sites. Today we are gathered here to witness the launch of an online dashboard that highlights key findings of the civil society organizations on their monitoring of the project. And interestingly, today marks 1,000 days since the first batch of 21 projects in the cleanup of Goni land were awarded. I wish to reiterate the personal commitment of President Mohammed Buhari and the Federal Minister of Environment to pursue the environmental cleanup of Ogoni land and indeed all oil polluted areas in the Niger Delta region and the country at large to its logical conclusion. I therefore commend the interest of SDN and other civil society organizations in this exercise. I wish to assure you all of the cooperation of the ministry and that of NOSTRA to ensure transparency and accountability in this very important task being executed by HIPRIP. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it is my sincere hope that today's event will go a long way in enhancing sustainable environmental management practices in the implementation of the cleanup of Ogoni land and save the Nigerian environment from further degradation. Thank you very much to the Honourable Minister of State for Environment, Sharon Ekiazo, for her kind goodwill message there. And, and great to hear once again the federal government of Nigeria reiterating their commitment to ensuring an effective cleanup in Ogoni land. And so next on the agenda, I will hand over to Jesse and Martin Manafort, our Senior Project Officer for Environment, to give you an introduction to our independent monitoring initiative. Jesse, over to you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. The Civil Society Independent Monitoring Project uh, commenced in 2020. But due to the days with COVID and all that, we are unable to start any full uh, monitoring activities until January of this year. This project is uh, as a result of a partnership between Stakeholder Democracy Network and Center for Environmental and Human Rights Development, which was funded by the Netherlands Embassy. We also saw a state that all the views and data on this presentation and this event today are strictly the views of SDN and CERD. The aim of the project was to contribute to ensuring transparency and high quality timely cleanup of oil pollution in Ogoni land. And we did this by engaging with high prep on our independent findings and to make the data available to the public, especially CSOs and media who may have need to use this, use our data for their work.
On this project, uh, the United Nations Environment Program assisted us by training 31 CSOs and local monitors on contaminated site assessment. In the project, we are monitoring 16 indicators, which range from contaminant levels in soil and water, as well as the performance, uh, perception of communities on how they see high prep and oil uh, cleanup contractors in terms of satisfaction and its their performance when they're carrying out the work. How did we do this? We conducted quarterly visits to collect data. We saw, carried out um, field surveys of residents in Ogoni. We also had close discussions with uh, the leadership in communities, including women and youth groups, and also collecting of soil sample data from cleanup contractors when they completed their cleanup at, their, at the docks. These, all these data were cleaned up and analyzed and put up on our dashboard and database on a, on a quarterly basis. Today, the first binary report is being launched and covers our work from January to June of this year. And we've had series of stakeholder engagement between CSOs and Hyper. We should compare our data and also discuss some of our findings. If you want to join and you know, follow up with what SDN's work, you can you know, sign up for our quarterly newsletter. The links to the dashboard and reports we sent to all attendees at the end of this webinar. If you have feedback and comments on our work, you can e email us on info at stakeholderdemocracy.org. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jesse. Um, and unfortunately, we don't seem to have um, Sam on the, the call yet. So I just wondered, um, if you wanted to, if you Jesse, if you could just see if you can get him available because he'll be speaking in about 10 minutes. Thank you. So the next thing we want to do is take you through our online dashboard. And so I will just share my screen with you in a moment. So as Jesse mentioned, one of the, the key things that we're doing in our current project is we've created the Agoniland cleanup dashboard on our website, which provides some summary data, key information from our monitoring project. Um, the first thing I'll point out is, is this section here. If you're on a mobile phone or if you have low bandwidth, we'd recommend switching over to a mobile friendly version of the dashboard. And uh, which is, is static, so you can't play around with the data, but it'll be much easier to view. And um, the next thing is to point out here is that we have you have the ability to download the database and um, which will contain all the raw data from our monitoring initiative. So if you want to conduct your own analysis on the data, you're very welcome to. As we scroll down to the dashboard, the first point to note here is that it'll note the latest date for which data is here. So we have data from the first and second quarters of this year. So it's up to date as of June, 2021 presently. This first set of boxes here gives a bit of a summary of where the overall cleanup is at. So we have 50 lots that have been handed over to contractors for remediation, 18 where in June we could tell that contractors were visibly active on site. 13, which had been signed off as complete by NOSTRA, the National Spills Detection Response Agency. And we also note the number of lots where we have tested soil and water samples and found contaminants greater than permitted levels. And these could be at sites where there is, you know, that the contractors have been told to return to site or potentially, as is the case, and Jesse will mention, at sites which have been certified as complete. The, the next section here is just a ticker showing how many days since the cleanup started, since contractors were, were handed their contracts. And of course, today is 1,000 days. As we scroll down, you'll find a map which shows the locations of each of the cleanup lots. And you can hover over one of these and you'll be able to see some basic information about that lot, such as where it is and the contractor that is responsible the volume of soil to be remediated, information like the status of cleanup at that site. You also have the ability to filter some of this data and that this needs to be corrected to say LGA here, but for example, you're able to filter to look at all cleanup lots 
in one particular local government area. Sorry, my screen is refreshing, so it hasn't done that correctly that time, but you'll be able to use these filters in that way. So there's an example. You can now see all the lots located in Gokana local government area. You'd also be able to search by a particular contractor or what the status of the cleanup site is, such as inspection and certification or construction of biocell, so on. As we go a bit further down, we've got a bit of a summary here, just showing what the status is of all active cleanup sites. So, so we split this into different phases, such as construction of biocell, soil excavation. You can find out what all of these means by looking at our detailed report and our database. And um, again, you can filter some of this data. What we'd like to do in future is be able to show you multiple quarters of data at once on this dashboard so you can get an, an, an a, a overview of how the cleanup is progressing. But this dashboard is still a work in progress. There are things that we want to improve and add to it. Um, and for that reason, we'd also welcome your feedback when you're using the database so that we can bear that in mind when we're looking to make future improvements. Down here, we've got just a bit of a summary of water provision. So some water provisions not started in any of the communities yet. Um, and here's a summary of how much soil has been reported as remediated and um, compared to the amount of soil, which is the, the target in contracts that have been signed so far with cleanup contractors. The final bit of the dashboard here, this top chart here shows the, the number of people from Ogoni communities that have been directly employed temporarily in the cleanup. You can see there's a very low proportion of women presently. And then we have a couple of things that look at levels of satisfaction with, with how high prep and contractors are working with communities. So we ask a series of questions, for example, about the level of information people feel they have, how they've been consulted, what opportunities they've had to participate and so on, and come up with an overall score between one and five. One meaning there's very low levels of satisfaction and five meaning that there's very high levels of satisfaction. And you can read more about the, the details of these again in our biannual report, which will be shared at the end of this, this webinar. And Jesse may say a little bit more about these findings. So, so this dashboard will be updated on a quarterly basis and, and so will the database itself. It will probably take around about a month from us conducting monitoring visits to, to input all the data, clean it and check it before publishing it. But the, this will be updated on a quarterly basis. And um, so I will stop there and hand back to Jesse to talk about some of the findings from our first biannual report. Jesse, over to you. Thank you, Calvin, for, for the presentation on the dashboard. Um, I want to provide, I'll provide um, a summary of um, our findings in the first uh, biannual monetary report. Like I stated earlier, um, it would be good for us to understand that this covers our findings between January and June of this year. Um, and also, our projects commenced in 2020, but due to COVID and other delays, we were unable to commence full monitoring activities until January of this year. So, our findings today will just focus on. What we've done in the first half of it. Okay. Um, first, uh, our monitoring project looked at the quality of remediation work being done by high prep and the cleanup contractors. The work, as we've seen, it is divided into broadly divided into simple sites and complex sites, and each of these sites are further subdivided into lots. So um, work has only commenced on simple lots, and there are 57 of such lots. However, looking at the table by my right, you find that 13 lot, 37 lots are still undergoing remediation. Step now undergoing assessment to find out if remediation should be done on them or not. Then 13 lots have been certified as complete. 
This 13 lots represent a quarter of all the lots that are supposed to be remediated. We were able to take six, sam six samples from six of these 13 lots. Unfortunately, we don't have data for the seven lots, the other seven lots, due to the delays I mentioned earlier. And I find it showed that at two of these lots, we had at least one sample which was above, which had contaminants above the threshold level. It's also good to point out that despite uh, the length of time that the project has, commenced, has lasted so far, complex sites are yet to there's work is here to commence on complex sites. Hence, um, we are still looking for when those complex sites will be announced and when contractors will you know, move to those sites. And we'll keep you guys updated on our observations and our reports from the complex sites as soon as they start. Community engagement is one of the key things that will lead to a successful cleanup because it ensures that communities have a buy-in and, and their participation and ownership in the process. To ensure that we're able to find out how the communities perceive and you know, the cleanup process in their communities, we surveyed 1,400 community persons in 14 communities in Oboni land across the four LGAs. We also had focus group discussions in 12 communities where we talked to community leadership, we had spoke to women groups and youth groups in the communities. We found out that in terms of awareness, there's a high level of awareness of what the cleanup is about because we discovered that 76% of our survey respondents were aware of at least three basic information about the cleanup. However, we found out that despite this high level of awareness of the cleanup, in some communities, there still seems to be this um, lack of understanding of what their roles and responsibilities are in the, in the cleanup, which has led them to make demands uh, to on high prep and the contractors, which are not covered under the cleanup. In terms of satisfaction, we also looked at defined satisfaction as how the people feel from whether they were consulted, their participation in the process, and the level of quality of information they received from, from both high prep and the contract. Uh, but we found that there is a mixed bag because looking at the graph on the screen now, you see that in terms of satisfaction for contractors, you see the little yellow, the green arrows point to contractors where the communities had a high satisfaction with the level of work in terms of the relationship with the contractors between contractors and communities. However, you also see that a bunch of other contractors performed poorly, which are indicated by the red arrows. So it's something that shows that, okay, it's a mixed bag. What are the lessons that could be learned from you know, those? Committees that perform better and then move them and you know, apply those same um, applications to those committees that perform forward. Generally, high prep and contractors have set up complaints and feedback processes to ensure that communities you know, have um, a way of reaching out to them when they have issues. But our uh, findings show that despite these processes being in place, they seem not to be working effectively as some communities have not had you know, opportunities of you know, complaining what their issues are or them being resolved adequately. And it's good that for us, we need to understand that for a project such as this, where there are low levels of satisfaction without an adequate system for complaints to be resolved, there's a tendency for it to lead to project disruption and conflict, which is something that needs to be managed adequately. On emergency measures, these are one of the things that um, the UNEP reports of 2011 pointed out. So uh, HYPER is supposed to provide portable water to communities as well as health audits or health screening across communities who are impacted by oil. For water, we found out that as of June 2021, contracts have been issued at six locations to provide water to communities. But at the end of that June, no communities have had access to portable water. In terms of health screening, no health screening has been done in anywhere in the, any of the communities. Livelihood is one of those other remits of high prep, which are supposed to restore the livelihoods of people and communities who have been impact, impacted by oil spill. We found out that despite providing over a thousand jobs 
temporary jobs to uh, community persons. There seems to be a very low female participation and inclusion in, in the process. As I find, you show that only 6% of all those who are employed by the cleanup are women. Hyperpass so that has gone further to employ and train 400 women in livelihood um, skills. But there are still complaints because we interviewed a couple of women and they had complaints at the quality of the starter packs that were provided to them. In terms of infrastructure, there are two key infrastructure that is needed to ensure an effective and proper cleanup of Ogoni. These two infrastructures, Integrated Contaminated Soil Management Center and the Center of Excellence for Environmental Remediation, are not yet in place. The Contaminated Soil Management Center is supposed to be a center where contaminated soil from complex sites are to be treated. This has not been put in place. Also, the Center of Excellence, which is supposed to train skill sets needed for environmental excellence in the regulation and other aspects of environmental management, is yet to be uh, established. These two key uh, infrastructure for a cleanup of, for hyper to effectively clean up the Ogoni area, this infrastructure needs to be put in place. We look forward to seeing a timeline for when this infrastructure will be put in place so that they will be there as soon as or before the complex sites remediation commences. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jesse, for that. Um, I see that Dr. Samkabari has still not joined us, Jesse. Um, should we jointly handle his section of the presentation, or do you know if he's he's able to join? I've been unable to reach him, so I think we should handle his bit. Okay, so so I suggest that, that between the two of us, we, we try and handle some of the, the key messages that, that um, Dr. Sam was going to talk about. So, so my apologies, our, our colleague from the Center for Environment, Human Rights uh, and Development has not been able to, to join us. Um, but Dr. Sam Kabari was going to then reflect on what our findings show um, from, from, from our initial report, thinking about the fact that we're 1,000 days into the cleanup. So, so Jesse, perhaps I'll take this first point and then hand over to you for the, the next two points on this slide. Um, if, if we think about being 1,000 days into the cleanup, that means we're over halfway through that five-year period, which the United Nations Environment Programme said it would take to conduct initial cleanup activities. Um, and, and where are we? we? We've seen a quarter of simple sites, as we showed earlier having been signed off as, as cleaned and certified, um, although we have some, some concerns with, with a couple of these. Um, but this is just a quarter of simple sites, and we have complex site cleanup yet to begin. So this shows that we have really quite a long way to go yet. Um, and, and I think achieving that, that five-year target seems perhaps not realistic now. So we really need to look at how the cleanup can be sped up that we can ensure um, that, that we, we have high quality, timely, effective cleanup in a timely period. And um, so I think that that's sort of the first key message to, to put across. Jesse, over to you for, for these points on community relations. Thank you, Calvin. Yes, um, despite there have been quite a lot of um, a huge amount of improvements in terms of community relations. Um, like my earlier presentation showed that um, there seems to be a high level of awareness in communities uh, um, in terms of what the cleanup is about to done. To ensure that communities are well informed of what's going on and it's done in a way that you know, they feel a sense of belonging and a sense of pride in you know, having some ownership of what's you know, which is um, still not been the case. Uh, also, the satisfaction is still high, um, but we expect that the process should be made a bit better in terms of looking at what are those areas of dissatisfaction, whether with high prep or with cleanup contractor, so that they could be resolved, so that the issues of conflicts uh, that will lead to disruption of the processes could be you know, avoided. That's what we're looking forward to uh, in, you know, in the next set of um, 
this will happen. Thank you, Jesse. Um, Dr. Sam, I see, I see you've been able to join now. Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Great. So, so thank you. Sorry that you are unable to join to this point. Jesse and I have just run through the first couple of points from your presentation. Would you like to pick up from this slide? Okay, that's fine. Um, my, you. my sincere apologies for joining late. Um, thank you, Jace, for standing in for me. Um, so we are looking at 1,000 days of the cleanup. Um, we have a number of um, categories of mandates that PIPREP was supposed to meet um, in Ogoni land. And one of them is the emergency measures. And um, we've seen that communities, a number of communities are still in urgent need of portable drinking water 10 years after the UNEP report. And we were expecting that by now, um, a number of communities will have access to portable drinking water. And we are happy that progress has been made in terms of contracts being awarded to companies to provide portable drinking water to um, communities. But in terms of communities accessing water from high prep, no community at the moment um, has achieved that. So we are, we are expecting that um, in the nearest future, uh, and, uh, communities should be able to have um, access to portable drinking water. And there are other issues on the emergency measures, including the health impact assessment, um, that has also not been done yet. And um, we think that having evidence to indicate what impact oil pollution has had on the people is a decision-making tool that we should have had um, by now as well. And then there are a lot of opportunities we expected that the cleanup came with that communities should have benefited from. And one of them is livelihoods. We understand, and it has also been reported, that High Prep has trained 400 women um, in different livelihoods. That is great. But we are looking at a situation where um, high prep can have a bigger picture and not just about training women um, in livelihoods or in sustainable livelihoods. We are looking at a situation where the Ogun economy can be revived, a situation where the economy can be diversified so that outside of women, both men and women can have access um, to livelihood opportunities. Okay, we are looking at a situation where beyond training um, of women or training of youths to sustainable wealth creation. Okay, what we have now is basically temporary jobs, temporary jobs where people are being paid on daily basis and there is no future in that. So we, we, we think that it is high time for high prep to sit back and look at how the whole opportunities presented by the cleanup can be utilized and the Ogoni people can maximize wealth creation from the process. Now, other opportunities also exist in terms of creating lasting um, skills, a skill park, knowledge and capacity, okay, for people from the Ogoni extraction to be able to have a stock of skills in remediation, environmental remediation and restoration so that they can be useful as well in the wider cleanup of the Niger Delta. But we are yet to also achieve that. And it is going to be difficult for us to have a template with which we can clean or remediate the wider Niger Delta if we do not have um, a skill pack of knowledge of capacity developed in Ogoni land. And then there are infrastructure that we are needed and for us to move um, that negative for us to develop that framework from Ogoni land to the wider Niger Delta. We needed the center of excellence um, and we also needed the integrated contaminant soil management center these facilities are not yet in place. And we are thinking that the only way high prep can create sustainable jobs in Ogoni land, the only way we can have a legacy, a pool of capacity that we can use in the remediation of the wider Niger Delta is for us to immediately establish the center of excellence and the integrated container soil management center, particularly now that high prep is moving from the simple sites to the complex sites. Those infrastructures are very, very key um, to the remediation of complex sites. Next slide. And so we need to move um, more faster. We need to, to do more to establish legacy, to instill confidence, uh, because um, if the Ogoni people or the, if the Ogoni remediation fails, 
then the people of the Niger Delta will not have the confidence in high prep to be able to undertake wider remediation in the region. So 1,000 days, we can see some progress, but we need to go faster. We need to improve on the quality, and we should think bigger when it comes to the legacy and that the cleanup can leave behind for Ogoni land and the wider Niger Delta. Thank you so much, Sam. I really appreciate that. I was really pleased that you were, were able to join us in the end. And you know, I echo everything that you said. You know, this is a, a really large scale project, the, the largest cleanup onshore in Nigeria, and um, with a budget of a billion dollars. There, there is, you know, we need to see a high quality cleanup. We need to see it delivered in a timely fashion. We also need to think about those wider opportunities to leverage on all the work that High Prep's doing to see a restoration of livelihoods in the Niger Delta and to build those skills so that we can see wider cleanup across the Niger Delta region. So I couldn't agree more with what you said. And um, thank you for those comments. Um, so now um, I'm just going to stop sharing my screen because I'm going to switch over slides here um, because we're going to hear from Marfa Rabani, the, the Executive Director at Lokiaka Community Development Centre, um, who has sent me some separate slides here. So I'm just going to open them up and share them on my screen in a moment so that you can see those um, before I hand over to Martha. Martha, yeah. of course, unfortunately, it seems that, that Martha has dropped off. Um, so what we'll try to do is, is hopefully Martha will, will reconnect before the end of the, the webinar. I really hope that, that she does because I mean, this was going to be a really great opportunity to sort of bring to life what oil pollution means in Agoni land and why this cleanup is, is so important. So um, I think what we'll try and do in that case is, is switch over to, to a Q&A um, and we'll see if Martha rejoins. Um, so if you just give me a moment, we'll get that started. And please do pop your questions into the Q&A box. Um, so, so the first question that we have here is from, from William, um, which is a question about the money, um, asking if there is any information available anywhere on how much money has been allocated to high prep and to date and who buy and how much has been dispersed so far to the cleanup. Um, Dr. Sam or, or Jesse, um, do either of you, um, I, th I think you might be able to at least partially answer this question. Um, I'll, I'll say that I don't have um, the exact figures um, of how much has been uh, disbursed to prep to date. But what I'm aware is that it's supposed to be about $200 million per year um, based on um, the $1 billion for the, five years, for, the first, for the five years of the project. So, and this is done by uh, the money is funded from uh, the Shell um, SBDC joint venture uh, agreement. That's where the funding is coming from. Thank you, Jesse. And I'm sorry, I see that, that Martha has now rejoined us. Um, so, so Martha, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Great. So, so sorry, we just skipped um, quickly over to, to start the Q&A because um, we saw you weren't here, but um, now you've rejoined us. And um, we'll go back to Martha's presentation and then get straight back to the question and answer session. So please do put your questions, comments into the Q&A box, and we will aim to deal with as, as many as possible. Um, but Marfa, glad to, to see you. Over to you. Yeah, I'm so sorry. This is not the best time for Zoom meetings because of the network seem to fluctuate so much. Uh, can you take me to the next slide? 
Oh, do I share the screen myself? No, it's okay. Just just tell me when you want me to, to move you to the next slide. Okay. So um, I want to stand on existing protocol on my presentation so that for want of time, I shouldn't really cut off much that I need to say. And I just want us to understand that whatever photographs you are going to find in this um, work are not uh, fictitious. They are real-time photographs taken by our organizations wise in the field carrying out environmental activities. Next slide, please. So quickly, um, some impacts of oil pollution in Ogoni land, they are quite enormous, but I just picked a few of these to share with us. We find out that um, since oil pollution started in Ogoni land, there have been low yields, we've been having poison crops, and people will wonder why uh, a community woman like me will be talking about poison crops. When we find out that whatever we harvest in our area has some uh, stench or maybe smell of, uh, you know, we, we, we perceive a petroleum kind of a kerosene in the food we have, and then they easily get decayed. We now understand that we are not eating the right food we used to have. And then there are a lot of pollution, which are very evident. They are very evident in the fish we get these days. They, they largely have taste, even in our crayfish, and, and of course the crustaceans we get in the environment. There is no water anywhere in Ogoni land, no portable water. We don't also have a lands for now. Lands are so expensive. The farm lands have been grossly destroyed. And even the arable lands, there's a lot of um, encroachment now on the few forests we have for um, maybe people's habitation and all that. Then we have lots of vegetation, the dry land, and of course the marine forest. All these have been destroyed because of um, oil pollution. What we have beyond having the deforestation, I call it desertification because you can travel miles on the uh, swamp forest without meeting any forest or finding any forest there. So we also have internally displaced persons because of the level of pollution. Even um, UNEP and High Prep had also instructed that people leave their communities where they were staying. So people are now hanging and sleeping, managing people's homes in other communities. We have destroyed livelihoods and their sources. The areas where these pollutions took place are actually people's uh, sources of livelihoods. You know? So now that they've been destroyed, people not have, they no longer have you know, means of uh, survival or even livelihoods as we and used to say. So there are challenges we are having and those are the impacts coming from. We also have heightened insecurity. People are unemployed, people are idle. They don't know what to do. The only thing they feel is maybe joining groups to see how they can make a living through some nefarious uh, means. Next slide, please. So um, one of our runs in um, Ogoni environment, carrying out our monitoring, we met some of our women because we are in the Lokianka Community Development Center is actually an environment and gender-led organization, which we also carry out um, forest and restoration you know, activities alongside what we do in capacity building campaigns and advocacies. So we met some of our women while we're basically in Kedere community, which is part of the Bomu oil field area. And they complained about their challenges and they now told me and my team that they now work as labor in other communities just to make a living. And we were really touched by that. So we needed to be certain about what they explained to us. So they took us to this um, swamp area where they normally go to pick their frustrations from. And then we worked with them. And for about three hours, these women did this work and they didn't get anything from their feet with crude oil substances and more stench on them. So these were some of the things we discovered within the environment. Next slide, please. Kevin. Okay, so we didn't just stay there. We also went to a community called Goi. Goi community is one community that is also highly polluted, highly devastated, though not in this area. 
we got there and we met some women fish sellers who were waiting for fishermen to come from the river. And so when they saw them and we got you know attracted by what was happening, we needed to know this. They met the man and when he came there, all we saw on him was this net already smeared with the crude oil. Even his body is putting on a yellow t-shirt here, but all his body was also stained. And then he came back with just about three tilapia, small tilapia in his bag and about seven crabs. So we wondered what that meant. And he said he's been toiling the whole day and he never got anything. So now that the tide was now um, flowing, he needed to come back home. So the women were disappointed again, meeting this situation. Next slide. But in the Ogoni land, it is not only the farming and fisher folks that are impacted by pollution. We also have other artisans like the potters and weavers. They are also negatively impacted. Like we got to um, um, Kwawa community, we met some potters there and they said, even though they can still get their cowling more to do the work they do, but they no longer have integrity. When they try to cake them, they normally crack. So they are now going down to having just um, the small pots being molded. Unlike what they used to do, they used to make uh, the uh, water pots. They also make the ones they use for cultural dances and all that. And similarly to the weaver, like we met, she said they can only get small fronts of the, um, the mat material. So what they produce now are small mats, unlike what they used to have. This used to be a very strong um, um, activity of the Weyakara communities. Next slide. Beyond um, the livelihoods that are being impacted in Ogoni land because of pollution, we also saw great challenges and you know impacts in terms of health. And this we looked at in terms of the level of deaths we were seeing happening in Ogoni land. And that was because something actually attracted us, continues to be there. And these posters were all wondering too. These posters are not all know when Nigeria is undergoing that process. poster that talks about maybe life well spent because they're going for indigenous people. Sometimes they, they, they celebrate their monarchs. And we also wondered, yes, there are schools all around Ogoni land, but where these school competitions, no. What we saw were actually burial posters. And that caught our attention to understanding why this were happening. When we look at these posters, what you find on them are young persons and that is why you have inscriptions like gone too soon, painful exit. And that traces us to the UNEP report that says Ogoni life expectancy is 45. And with the delay we are having in the environmental restoration, we want to believe that the life expectancy would have also dropped beyond uh, 45. So, and we as civil society looked at this and understood that yes, these deaths are not really spiritual like they were thinking because we saw a lot of churches proliferating around the area. People are now beginning to be too spiritual, believing that it is the gods that either are against them or having some anger or issues around them. So they're not trying to be more spiritual about their uh, you know, uh, life. But we now trace it that there are actually issues around the petroleum hydrocarbon presence, high you know, presence of it in surface and underground water, air and soil. And that is where these people are living from. The Ogoni people, majority of them are self-employed persons. They use their hands to earn a living and their subsistence in all that they do. Next slide, please. Thank you, Martha. I'm, I'm, I'm conscious we need to move to the Q&A. So could I just ask you to, to make any sort of concluding concluding remarks um, before I hand over to the Q&A? Yeah, I think the sliding this in is taking, is taking my time. I would have done it faster than this. It's a, so it's please okay. just move on, move on for me so that I can just wrap up. Okay, next, 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 next slide. So we, on this, decided to come up with a strategy. What can we do to help? If the Ogoni UNEP report says it's going to take about 25 to 30 years to have the environment clean, remediated and restored. And these people are already uh, job 
less, they're already out of their livelihood in the environment and lost livelihoods. They don't need to stay that way. If they are not serving as labor, those who were before this time, food baskets, and those who were supporting and supplying food to the river state uh, you know, indigents, then we need to also see what we can do. So we came up with a paradigm shift, and that took us to training women on uh, small nurseries, mangrove, and uh, other economic tree trainings. After that, women came up to doing this in their various homes to earn a living from that, nurseries to market to sell, just to support themselves. And we saw that their uh, nurseries were not really doing great as we wanted. And within polluted environment, the water they use in shed water. So we needed something more sustainable. That took us to getting a site where we now brought all this the mangrove cultivation, take oil field area. Can you take me to those slides so that I quickly wrap up on them? working together, trying to push them on with that kind of um, this in there. It's not like a paradigm shift from what used to be Women don't really need to wait for, uh, maybe to have their crops like cassava planted for 10 months before they can harvest. But with the nurseries, in a few months, they can always sell and make a living from it. Some of them go to work as labor in other areas. Bringing them together to now work in the uh, mangrove and swamp forest was also engaging them and making them have opportunities for livelihoods. And within what we we also had great role to play in environmental Sorry, restoration. Martha, I'm afraid that your done, connection is, is starting to become and worse, it's actually, so we're not you know, hearing you fruit. so well. So conclusively, I would like to say that. So that um, in it. So, I now, really? OK, so if the organic clean are, are we getting me? Martha, sorry, your connection me? has been coming increasingly worse. If, if you could sort of, do, do you have one or two sentences that you want to say as a, a conclusion, if we can still hear you? Because I'm, I'm mindful we've got quite a lot of questions, so, so we need to move on to that, I'm afraid. I think we've, we've lost... Martha's connection anyway so so I'm sorry about that everyone and um, but I will we will move over to the the Q&A section once again now um William I'm so, sorry because I sort of cut off the 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 response to to your question around um the the the, the finances and I think I think it's true we'd like to see and much greater transparency around this as well. And, and this is something that we don't have full access to. Um, as as Jesse had, had mentioned, the, the budget is theoretically around $200, um, sorry, $200,000, uh, sorry, $200 million a year. Um, and, and we know that, that um, a proportion of that has been paid into to the escrow account. Um, I believe that, that it, it's a sort of a relatively minor proportion of it that has been spent so far um, because activities have been, been somewhat slow in the first um, thousand days. Um, but but um, yeah, I wonder, Sam, did you want to say anything more on the, the finances before I move to the next question? Okay, yeah, as at, as at the end of um, sometimes in 2020, High Prep has received $360 million. And about the last quarter of the same year, um, they also got some funds, but uh, it's not in the public domain how much that they have gotten. But we can confirm uh, um, authoritatively that High Prep has received. Um, over $360 million. And as I, when we got that information, they've only been able to spend $40 million. Um, so that's, that's um, what we had as at um, probably second quarter of 2020. 
Thank you, Sam. That's great. And I'm aware we've gone past the, the 11 o'clock mark. Uh, my apologies for that. So we, we still have quite a lot of questions coming in. So I think we're going to aim to to stay on questions if you're able to stay in the room till about um, 10 past 11, um, at, at which point we'll give Prof. Philip Shakola an opportunity to speak before we close the webinar. But um, obviously, if, if you're able to stay on, we will try to answer as many of the, the questions that we've got here as, as possible. Um, so I will just move through these. I, I, I see that um, Mike Cowing from, from UNEP had, had made a comment as, as well here, which I, has been answered now, I think, but he's made some, some good points about how we need to see um, crack, which is, is basically the, 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 the process that's been set up for managing complaints and, and relations with communities um, set up by high prep. We need to see um, sort of improvements to that process to ensure we avoid community conflict and um, conflict. And, and I appreciate also your point, Mike, about needing to build capacity further before complex sites can be adequately addressed because they're going to be a much greater technical challenge for cleanup than, than with the simple sites. So thank you, Mike, for, for, for those comments. I really appreciate those. Um, from from Mohammed Gumsuri here. We, we have comments that SDN should strongly consider creating more enlightenment on the issue of artisanal refining activities and vandalism. There is a need to escalate this discussion considering the huge contribution of this menace to devastation of the Niger Delta and livelihoods there. Highlighting this narrative can also tilt relevant state governments to do more on providing alternative livelihoods for the teaming youth involved in illegal activities. So I think this is a, I mean, a, quite right to to raise this point. So there is um, still large scale sort of tapping of oil pipelines and, and spills which come from this, which is not an issue that we've really had an opportunity to to say much about in this presentation. Um, but I think that that obviously in ensuring a cleanup, the the repollution that's happening from these activities is a really important consideration. So I, I do appreciate your comment there. I wonder if, if Jesse or Dr. Sam wanted to, to say anything in response to that comment. And if not, I will move on to, to the next point here. Um, the, this is a, a really good question, um, which is if the progress is slow on the cleanup, what does SDN believe needs to be done specifically to speed things up? Um, Jesse, do you want to, to take a go at answering that first? Okay, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, what we believe is there are um, a couple of, for instance, uh, we've had um, contractors being slow at site. Um, some of those issues from our findings had to do with um, the, for instance, the board not being set up on time. There was a delay in setting up the board. Um, so something like that is, is something that should be looked at, even without should be put in place. So even if the board is not in place, protect contractors could still be carrying out their work. The assurances that their funds will be you know, sent to them as soon as there's um, a functional board in place. Also, one of the things that have slowed down the process is the rains. Um, rain down here in the Niger Delta could be uh, something that could you know, delay progress at work, especially with remediation. So we expect that uh, for high prep and the contractors to utilize most of the dry season to ensure that work is done speedily during those periods. Uh, so that once the rain starts, uh, it could be, you know, if it slows down, it doesn't affect the overall speed of work. But generally, it's, um, for us, it's, it has to do with trying to make sure that the finances are there on time for the contractors to do their work and also trying to manage the weather to ensure that work is done at the time that there's you no know, bit of dry season. Thank you, Jesse. I, I know a few people have raised their hands. If I can ask if you could please type your questions into the, the Q&A box and that's how, how we'll handle the Q&A, please. There, there is a, a similar question here from Mark Pearson about if, if there's concern about the pace of the cleanup, what are the challenges faced regarding the pace? 
Um, is it access to availability of funds, difficulty in getting contractors on the ground, um, and so on. And I, and I think similarly to what Jesse has said, and I, and I think there's a, there's a very good um, demonstration of this, that there are a series of, of issues with the sort of the governance structures of, of high prep, where we, we could see um, work happen more quickly. So we had a period of, um, I don't know exactly, but perhaps six months, um, where we didn't have any a board of trustees or governing council in place, um, so it wasn't even possible for for funds to be signed off to to continue with activities. So I think there is a wider need to look at the overall sort of governance and management of the project to ensure that it 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 is managed and governed in an efficient way. Um, obviously, whilst we want to see speed. We also want to see quality. We don't want to see um, the quality of the cleanup and the management of funds, the proper management of funds and um, sacrifice just for the sake of speed. But we need to see um, everything working more efficiently. I'd, Dr. Sam, on, the, on this point of delays and the need to, to speed up activities, do you have anything you want to add? I think you've, you've um, added what I wanted to say, but one other point, is that HyperB needs to ensure that contractors are paid as at when due. Um, the funds are available, so it's not a funding problem, it's just a bureaucracy problem. The procedures as to how contractors access funds is something very um, procedural. So it's, it's something that HyperB looks in, needs to look into. And then the second thing is that Hyperp is not totally independent to spend funds. And that is not the structure uh, that will help Hyperp to function effectively. Hyperp needs to be independent. It's not every time Hyperp needs to spend funds, it rushes back to the Federal Ministry of Environment. We need that level of independence for Hyperp because issues of contaminated land management are issues of urgency, they are issues of hazards. So they need to have the freedom to spend money when um, due. That was why we needed to have a trust fund because the money was not passing through the normal process of, um, uh, of a conventional government. So the Federal Ministry of Environment needs to ensure that HyperP has that level of flexibility, that level of freedom to spend um, money as I went due on the ground. Thank you, Dr. Sam, appreciate that. Next question here is, has any regulatory measure been developed to prevent the recurrence of oil spillage in these communities? Jesse, over to you. Um, well, the issue of um, oil spillage, for instance, um, there's no oil production um, ongoing in Ogoni land, but there's still uh, incidents of oil spills. And these are uh, uh, functions of um, artisanal oil refining, which is ongoing in the area. Um, it's been quite um, a difficult thing to you know, deal with. Uh, the government has tried the modular refinery approach, um, which hasn't um, curbed, curbed it um, as well. Also, but there, under high prep, there's this plan to you know, provide alternative livelihoods to use um, so that they, they will move away from uh, at snow refining. That's the approach, you know, providing livelihoods so that people can stop engaging in that snow refining. But the question is, um, would the livelihoods which we provided, would they provide these young people with um, the kind of remuneration that is commensurate with what they get from at snow refining, which is an open-ended question. But in terms of what has been done, the government has tried to do a few things, but they've not been effective at uh, coping up at snow refining. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. So, so what I'm going to do is because is we've already reached um, 10 past 11, we, we have sort of four remaining questions in, in the q and I'm going to see if we can answer each of those in as succinct a way as possible. And then I'm going to hand over to Prof Shikola to, to provide the closing remarks. I would encourage anyone who wants to discuss any of this further with us to contact us on info at stakeholderdemocracy.org. That, that email address is in this presentation and you'll get a follow-up email from us after 
this event as well and we'd be more than happy to discuss and answer any of your questions so so the the question here i suppose it is quite a, a complex one but I, i'll just try and summarize what's put here is Firstly, if there's any more specific scientific research on the current state of the Diogoni environment, so I suppose given that the UNEP report was, was published in 2011, 10 years ago, um, and also making the point that there seems to be, you know, that the, the fact of the, the slow process in, in, in the opinion of the, the person asking the question here is, is maybe a political thing. So what have CSOs been doing to try and speed up the, the pace? Um, yeah. Perhaps, Jesse, would you like to, to answer this one as well? Sorry, Calvin, I didn't quite get the question. Okay. And, uh, perhaps, Dr. Sam, did you hear that question? And can I? Yes, I, I heard you. Okay. Over, um, over you. Okay. HyperP does not, or there is no general research. Okay, or scientific evidence further than what UNEP did. But what HyperP does is that for every site that HyperP is going to remediate, there is a reassessment. There is what we call a reconnaissance and visit. There is a reassessment of that site to know the true state of the environment, um, to make informed decision on what sort of remediation approach should be adopted. Um, but there is no general research as to the state of the environment in Ogoni or anywhere in the Niger Delta. What happens is once high prep has delineated a particular site for remediation, there is a reassessment on that particular site to know the state of um, the pollution so that an informed decision can be made. Then in terms of what CSOs are doing, um, I think we've, we've put a lot of pressure on high prep um, to ensure that there is a plan, not just for Goniland, but for the wider Niger Delta. Because the mandate that the federal government gave to high prep was not just to focus on Goniland, and that's why we are talking about legacy um, to move from Ogoliland to the wider Niger Delta. So we've been putting this pressure on high prep to ensure that the sort of UNEP report that was done in Ogoliland is done in other places in the Niger Delta. So we have a first hand information as to the nature of oil pollution in those areas. Thank you, Dr. Sam. There are there are two quite similar um, questions here, which I, I'll hand over to, to you, Jesse. And um, the first one is what's been the role of traditional institutions in monitoring, owning, and making sure high prep carry out carries out its mandate in compliance to international standards? And the second one is what is the level of Agoni leadership support and commitment to the cleanup? So can I ask you to answer that one? I, I will answer the, the very final one. And I'm afraid that any further questions, what, what we'll do is we'll, we'll take them away and we'll get back to, to each of you individually if we can on any remaining questions. O over to you, Jesse. Um, well, traditional institutions from what we've gathered have been, uh, HyperP has engaged the traditional institutions quite well um, under this project. Um, there are regular stakeholder engagement meetings, uh, town hall meetings with the uh, traditional rulers. So there's some form of, um, in terms of level of ownership and awareness of what's going on, yes, I'll say the traditional leadership institutions are, are well aware of what's going on um, under the cleanup process. However, um, the next question of whether it's in compliance and international standard, we have to understand that um, the process of ensuring that, for instance, um, soil analysis is done to uh, international standards involves science um, and some the traditional institutions are not uh, well equipped to you know, carry out such um, scientific studies to understand if it's done to international standards. But um, I could say that HyperP has tried to you know, carry them along in all they are doing. But in cases where it's not done, um, we've seen where some you know, community leaders, you know, they have factions in their communities and they complain about not being carried along. Those are the cases where we've seen, but generally, I would say HyperP has tried as much as the crew to you know, inform a traditional institution of what's going on and they've you know, taken ownership. Because for instance, the number of um, the community workers for each of the contractor are you know, given to the contractors by the traditional institutions that are not imposed on them. So uh, that's a clear example of uh, an ownership of the process. 
Thank you very much, Jesse. The, the last question that we'll be able to, to answer here, and I do apologize to anyone else that, that we haven't been able to respond to, is from Beauvais. Um, really interesting points around you. Know, so wanted to know more about the outcomes on local economy, peace, social stability, health and wellness in Agoni land. Um, asking if there's, a, there's an overall monitoring plan for the project. Has it met its indicators? Um, and, and finally, if there are any specific economic development plan for Agoni land other than the, the palliatives in, in form of training 400 rural women, um, which is, is fairly low given the, the population of Agoni land. So let me just try and make a few final points in relation to this. I think you know, the, the point on health here, I think, is, is a really important one. And we mentioned that the, the sort of the health surveys that are supposed to happen have not happened yet. And so we don't really know, we don't really have a proper understanding of the health impact in Agoni land. And that's really concerning. And, and without that initial understanding, then, then how can we pro adequately respond to the health impacts? So, so this is, you know, from my personal point of view, something critical and um, that we really need to see happening under the HyperEP project. Um, on the monitoring plan, yes, HyperEP has its own indicators. Um, one quick thing I'll say is that, that our own indicators, um, we try to mirror HYPEPS indicators uh, as much as possible um, and, and added to our, some, some of our own to this. Um, so, so that helps to, you know, our own monitoring project is, is showing what progress is being made, but, but HYPREP does have its own monitoring plan. Um, I can't say specifically on this event sort of how um, their indicators and progress towards them look after 1000 days and perhaps Prof Philip might be able to comment briefly on that um, when I hand over to him in a moment. Um, and, and the final point you make around livelihoods, I do just want to touch on again. You know, this is a, a billion dollar project in Agoni land. That's a big project. You know, and again, I'll say it again, the largest onshore, onshore oil spill cleanup in Nigeria, which has a remit not just of cleanup, but, but the restoration of livelihoods. So my personal opinion is, yeah, we need to think really big here. Um, you know, training of a, a, a few hundred um, women in, in livelihood skills is, is fantastic, but we've got a population of around a million and we need to think about how we leverage the opportunity of this cleanup to work with other parts of government to work with the international community to to have a, a bigger wider plan for economic development in agoni land take advantage of the opportunities in the cleanup to see a wider plan for economic restoration not just restoration of the environment in agoni land um, but but on that that point, I, I will say that we we will um, try to get back to everyone on, on any other questions that we've been unable to answer. I do apologise that we haven't been able to to answer everyone's questions, um, but obviously we, we've already sort of spent quite a lot longer than than going to eleven o'clock. I'm going to try to hand over now to Prof. Philip Shikolo and to give him the opportunity to, to provide some closing remarks before we end the um, webinar. So, so Prof. Philip Shikolo is, is Head of Operations and, and the officer overseeing the, the Project Coordination Office in, in High Prep. Um, Prof, I've just given you the opportunity to, to unmute yourself. Can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you loud and clear. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. So, so over to you, sir. Thank you very much. I must start by um, addressing the Honorable, I mean, His Excellency, the Ambassador of um, Netherlands, the Honorable Minister of um, Environment, uh, the HMS, um, the Executive um, members of the SDM and the SED, uh, and those who are on this call, I want to say thank you for the opportunity to make this um, closing remarks. I must start by I actually appreciating and commending the efforts of um, SDN in this monitoring and evaluation exercise of um, the Health Prep um, project, which, as you know, is at the heart of the federal government. It's um, a flagship and a very important program for the president, President Mohammed Buhari. And we take it with all seriousness and commitment to ensure that we deliver 
uh, these projects successfully. Um, having said that, I want to also thank um, Nostra for their role in um, ensuring the quality. I want to also thank um, UNEP, who have been there as QAQC uh, in, in all areas, every area basically uh, of this project, you know, both areas, technical areas, and managerial areas, administration of the project. They have been there giving support and uh, giving us feedbacks. And I take all the feedbacks from today uh, on this call, on this report, on this dashboard as a gift. This feedback is a gift. I want to take it as a gift and use it you know, effectively to improve the delivery of this project. Uh, I must say I, I made a written um, response to the you know observations that were uh, that, were, that were made on the quality of um, um, filling up by some contractors at the two sites, and I my feedback was that we need to have a, a put a cap on what we call the risk based concept. You know we are going to be looking at not just crunching numbers but looking at the risk based concept in remedial standard. Um, because the, the idea basically is for us to ensure that the health of the people, the environment itself is returned to a level that it can sustain and the purpose for which it is meant. And, you know, quality, quality of life is very important. Um, as you said, we, are, we have been working and um, we are fa fairly behind time by maybe one and a half years of the in initial project, but we are making every effort to ensure that um, there is a recovery of this uh, lost time. And one of the ways that we are ensuring that this happens, as um, Mike rightly you know, pointed out, is for us to increase capacity. Capacity of supervision, capacity of project management, yeah, and um, selection of competent contractors that we know that can deliver. And, and that's where we need to have maybe a workshop with you, and with Trinip, to address these issues gently and to come up with some practical solutions that we need to put together to ensure that the, there's improvement in the capacity of, uh, of supervision of projects and management of the project. We, we still want to be, we are still partnering with um, UNEP and uh, UNOPS to see how UNOPS may come into this and um, also support the project in this area. And um, area I just want to also talk about is the area of conflict resolution. We have in place CRAC. CRAC is the Central Representative Advisory Council which is um, a provision that we have in the Gazette. And these are people drawn from all the local government areas of Ogoni. Traditional rulers are involved. We have civil society represented. We also have um, people from the industry. And um, INEP is also there a part of, as, as a member of CRAC. And these are people that have the first-hand interaction between the project and the people. So they are the primary contact that we have in reaching out to the communities. And now we, are, we have been able to, we, we have started establishing the area offices of high prep. These are the areas where they'll be lodging all the complaints that they have with the CDOs, the officers and the crack members right there. We have, we have we've commissioned the body uh, high prep area office um, last month by honorary minister, uh, before the honorary minister of environment, Dr. Mahmoud, was commissioned, and it's a very good facility that will be used to reach out to the people to get your project closer, closer to the people so that all the complaints are lodged in writing and we can respond to them as required. So in the area of, um, um, uh, of checking the health of the other environment outside the area already uh, documented, we have last year undertaken a reconnaissance and sampling um, I mean, reconnaissance investigation of undocumented sites in, in conjunction with UNEP. And we have reports and we are going to go into the next phase based on the outcome to do a more detailed assessment of these undocumented sites so that we are not just leaving it to where we have worked. Uh, where we have already assessed, we normally carry out a delineation and a scoping process before we put a contract in place for the remediation process. In the area of public health, yeah, last month we carried out what we call um, um, health situation analysis, and we were able to reach 
over one three, um, over eleven thousand people were actually reached, and we collected data on the health situation analysis of these people, and the idea is to feed this into the um, the core studies that UNEF will be supporting us using the WHO in, in carrying out the the, the 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 health inventory of of of, of impact of oil spills in the communities. And this is going well. I mean, you're not aware of that because uh, it wasn't before June. It happened just last month, September, and, uh, August, September. So basically, we are doing something in the public health domain. And as you know, the likelihood is not limited to only 400 women that were trained last year. We have run, we are running out about 5,000 forms for needs assessment because we want the youths basically to state, uh, identify, and write, you know, select the, the particular um, career or, or the occupation they will want to be given training on. So this basically is what we're doing. And um, we are gradually moving into that phase. And we believe that that will bring a lot of changes, positive changes to the communities, um, uh, you know, um, uh, with like unemployment problems. And it will also help to probably solve, to a certain extent, the issue of um, engaging in um, illegal refining activities, which is very dangerous to their health. We need to also do what you call behavioral change. And you know, civic education is required to let them know the impact of um, illegal, ref illegal, uh, illegal refining on their health. Because it's better for them to earn a little bit more, uh, a little bit less money than to earn much money and they die because of the impact of such hydrocarbon emissions in the, on their health. So these are the things we're going to be using to bring them up, up speed. In terms of center of excellence, yes, we had some delays, but we are now planning, and we have advertised um, the design of center for center of excellence, and it's going to be, we're going to have it, maybe we shall involve you in looking at it and seeing exactly how we're going to combine center of excellence with the center uh, of um, internet, integrated center for uh, for the contaminated soil management. We want to have them in one spot. I want to have them in a way that we can address situations in a practical way. We don't need to uh, create the things that um, are, are not, uh, will, will not be feasible, and they will not answer the practical questions, but we want to be realistic in the waste streams we are looking at, even at the, uh, the complex sites. The complex sites basically is um, dealing with groundwater um, remediation and contamination that has happened over the years. So it's not something that uh, you can just um, um, excavate and take to a, a integrated and good contaminated treatment center. These are things that you need to do in situ to groundwater remediation. It's mostly an in-situ activity, not something you take to, a, 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 to, 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 to take from one spot, to take to a, an external or, you know, um, spot to to remediate. So basically, we are going to look at this and be more scientific in the way we approach and use this um, center to solve the problems that we have identified. So in terms of um, funds release, we have really we have received funds from the uh, contributors and financials. There is some um, SPDC JV Ventures. Um, we have received for two years, 2018 and 2019. And total, total of um, 360 million has been realized. Um, there hasn't been um, a drawdown in 2020 and 2021, but the board of the board of trustees are working to make this drawdown happen uh, as soon as possible. So basically, and um, of, out of this, about 51 um, about 51 um, um, million dollars have been released to uh, to 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 high prep for their for their contracts and other uh, management and uh, project management in you know uses, so we're working gradually to ensure that um, we improve our speed by increasing past capacity and uh, by improving the project management um, processes in, in the entire uh, uh, project um, uh, management um, um, paradigm. So thank you very much for for this. I don't want to take much of your time. We have had. A lot of time here now, but basically this uh, the general will not call it a summary of where we are. So thank you very much for this time and for the roles you are playing and for the recommendations that you have made. We should sit down as a, we should take it as a gift 
and we can sit down at maybe at, at a workshop of, for, two, for one or two days and be able to see how we can put this thing into practice. Thank you for your cooperation and thank you for your partnership. Thank you very much, Prof. Philip. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, really interesting to hear those remarks. Um, a couple of things to, to pick up on is, yeah, I appreciate the, the constructive manner in which the, the, our feedback is, is being dealt with. And I think, you know, taken with its intention to make sure that we find practical solutions um, to ensuring an, an effective clean up in Agoni land um, and we look forward to, to discussing all of the, the matters that, that we've raised on, on today's presentation with you further. Um, and, and good to hear, for example, that things like the, the health survey have kicked off and really look forward to hearing more about that. So, so to conclude, um, thank you to all of you and, and many of you stayed on, even though we've, we've now gone half an, over, an hour over the original time. So really appreciate that there's been so much interest in this webinar. And um, thank you once again to all of our speakers. As soon as we can get this video uploaded, we'll be emailing all of you with links to a recording of today's event, to the report, to the dashboard. That will come from our info at email. So if you do have further questions and matters you want to discuss, just respond to that and we'll get back to you as quickly as we can. Um, but thank you so much again for your attendance today to all our speakers. I hope you found it an informative session and we look forward to continuing to, to discuss the progress of the Agonia Land cleanup with all of you. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you very much indeed.